did not get the chance to say this right at the beginning. It's a tremendous honor to be sitting in front of this audience. This is my first appearance in India. Uh, I'm really, really happy to be here. My first appearance here as an author, I've been to India many times before. My first visit to Goa was in 2003, I think it was. It's been a while, and this is, I've come here several times since. Uh, and you ask, why, is this man, why does this man keep coming back to Goa? The reason is because my wife is from Goa. So I'm a son-in-law of this great region of the world. And um, I've always been met with nothing less than a wonderful welcome here. Um, my parents-in-law are in the audience. And uh, Alfred and Christine, it's a great honor to have you be here with me. This passage I'm going to read is a little bit, just a little bit different from the general tenor of the book. The book is actually very interior, very quiet. Um, the way my wife describes it is that it's the, the best way to read Open City, and I, and I think she's right because one's wife is always right, um, is to wake up at three in the morning when the house is quiet and read it in your solitude. It was a warm day but not so warm that the great lawn was packed. We were part of a crowd of city dwellers in a carefully orchestrated fantasy of country life. Moji had brought Anna Karenina with her, and she leaned on her elbow and read from the thick volume. It was one of the new translations, only occasionally interrupting herself to participate in the conversation. And a few yards away was a young father calling out to his toddler who was wandering away. Anna. Anna. Zebold, of course, so very intriguingly used black and white photographs to accompany his text in some of his books. Uh, is that something that uh, you see yourself doing at some point, uh, just to provide some sort of a yeah. contrast or a counterpoint between the, the word and the image? Yeah, I mean, already, in a, in a funny kind of way, the open city does not contain any photographs, but in a funny sort of way, I, I feel like said the photographs are implied. It's a very photographic book. It's full of rich description. And many passages in the book are the photographs I wish I could have taken. I wonder if having my photographs as part of my novels might set up too much of a resonance or competition behind them. Um, if I had photographs in a book, they would have to be more muted than the kinds of photographs that I already have. I mean, all photographs are mute, obviously. They, they, they can speak. They don't have any sound. But I think you would need something like Zabal's, which are very, very moody, in order to work with the text. Otherwise, there's too much fireworks. Can you tell us a little bit about your interest in the history of cities, how cities yeah. become what they are through uh, the, the, the movements of, uh, you know, the, the, the trajectories of... Uh, various communities that pass yeah. through them, build them, because that's something that, that's a recurring theme in Open City. Yeah. And the very title of the book, Open City, it has shades of meaning. It, it, it refers primarily to the, the two major cities in the book, uh, New York and Brussels. And it really sort of, it, it means different things, doesn't it? That's right. Open City, an open city is, uh, many of you will know this phrase, it's a technical phrase for a city in wartime that has made a deal with an invading enemy and has invited them to come in in exchange for not being destroyed. So an open city is one that is, uh, is occupied. It's an occupied city. Brussels during World War II, Manila during World War II, um, Paris during World War II. So you have these images of Picasso. He's doing his work. Meanwhile, Nazis are marching under the window and doing their drills. Um, and the corollary, if you're not an open city, is that you get bombed, like London, Tokyo, uh, Dresden, Berlin, did not surrender, and so they were destroyed. Um, and they, they are just, somebody said cities are humankind's greatest invention. Um, and that's, that's a curious phrase for two reasons. One, we don't think of cities having to be invented. But if you think about it, we started off rural. Like animals are rural, you know? Um, and then at, at a certain point, I think somebody thinks it's in Turkey somewhere, but there was the first cities were formed, or maybe it was in Iraq, um, where people decided to live in very large numbers, very close to each other. 
so a city is a kind of technology, and uh, the technology of the city leads to many other human innovations in which we have to live together and we have to get along. Um, so you have to have sewers, and you have to have drainage, and you have to have streets. Without cities, you don't really need streets. And then once you have city, you have streets. And then at some point, you have to have street lamps. <laughs> and then you have to have parks. If you're in a village, you don't need a park because you're in the village. And on all these other things. But what you also have to have is theories of getting along with each other that are not based on tribe or caste or race. Because in a city, you have to have all kinds of people who are not slaughtering each other. And so you, have, you start having theories of human civilization um, that are based on things other than traditional values. In the next few days, um, I'll be talking much more extensively about cities with Amitav, Amitava Kumar, and I'll be in conversation with uh, Manshu Suri also. So, uh, I'll, uh, so I'll be able to take questions at, at any of those events. Right, so you'll, you'll have a lot more from the son-in-law of Goa. Uh, coming out of that, uh, but thanks a lot, uh, Teju, for uh, thank, for everything. Thank you. Thank you to the audience as well. Thanks to the audience. Thank you.